Well, good morning, everybody. Sorry it's a little warm. You guys a little warm this morning? Something going on with the, the AC. So I checked. I think it might have just been the breaker. I turned it back on. Hopefully it'll start to cool down in here a little bit. But um, yeah, so sorry about the heat. But I can leave if you want me to. <laughs> uh, all right, turn in your Bibles to Micah chapter 2. We started Micah a couple weeks ago. Last week I was sick, but the Lord healed me quickly. Thank you for your prayers. Praying that this flu bug stops and that too many people don't get sick. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today for us. We know that it's living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, God. And we ask you today that you would pierce our hearts. Pierce our hearts with your word. Pierce our hearts with your Holy Spirit. Teach us, God, so that we can be like you. So that we can treat people the way that you would treat them. Not even that we would treat them the way that, that you would like them to be treated, but we would treat them the way that you would treat them and we would be influenced by your Holy Spirit to do that. We live in a, a day and age now, God, where there's bickering and fighting and everybody has opinions and is offended. God, we ask that you would empower us with your Spirit to be the kind of people who shine brightly the light of your Holy Spirit. That we wouldn't respond like the world responds when things happen. We would respond in compassion and in love. That we would be known for our love for one another and we would even be known for loving our enemies and those outside these four walls. And we can't do that ourselves. So we need you, God. We ask that you bless your word today because it is blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. The first week when we were in Micah, we talked about um, consequences for sin. Consequences, uh, they come, especially if you have kids or you were a kid at some time, you reap the consequences of your actions, right? And we talked about how God's heart for the nation of Israel was for them to be a representation of who God was. But then they left not only what God's will was for them, but they, they didn't care to be his representative. And because of the sin that they allowed in their country to go unchecked, uh, God is warning them now of the consequences that are coming. God is faithful. We talked about a couple weeks ago as well, didn't we? God is faithful to warn. He's faithful to warn. He's not the tyrannical God that as soon as you make a mistake or he's waiting for you to trip up, he's there to smack you across the head. That's not our God. Our God is a God of compassion. He gives us chances. He gives us warnings. And that's how he wants us to treat others as well. I want to ask you to do something a little different than normal, but just bear with me. Grab something that you have around you, something that's valuable to you that's on your person, and hold it up in the air. How many phones? Oh my goodness. Hold it up high. Hold it up high. What's something that's valuable to you? Now look around. Look at the things that people are holding up. Look. Look around. Okay, put your hands down. Oh, okay. I'm so proud of you, Kobe. Now, when you looked around at the things around you and you saw different items, the thing that you should have been thinking probably is that you were content with what you had, right? I mean, I've got this thing that I like and I held up my Bible, I think. I'm content with this. This is a good study Bible. I love it. And when you look around, you see things that other people have. And then all of a sudden, when you look at things that other people have, your attention gets redirected from what you have. And sometimes you look at what somebody else has and you say, oh, that thing is better than what I have. And that's what I want. It's called covetousness. 
And when we talk about covetousness in the body of Christ, in the church, we are not covetous people. We are content with the things that God has provided for us. We are content with the things that God has blessed us with. And I think that we understand that. You know, it's the, the, the Joneses looking to what our neighbor has, what kind of success, where they're traveling at summertime on Facebook now. On Instagram, you can see all these exotic places that your friends are going to. And there's that little piece of your heart that says, you dirty dog, I want to be up in the mountains right now. No, I'm, I'm fine where I am. The two sins that God is going to address for the nation of Israel in chapter 2 is covetousness and pride. Covetousness and pride. It's them saying, we have this stuff as a nation. Not only is it ours that we created or that we got for ourselves, but it was something that God had given them as an inheritance. If you're taking notes, you can jot that word down this morning, write it, inheritance. You know why? Because not only the nation of Israel had an inheritance that was a blessing from God, but you and I have an inheritance in Jesus Christ that is exceedingly precious. It's a good gift that God has given us. It's a good inheritance. And when we are content with the inheritance that God has given us through his son Jesus, we're not worried about what other people have. We don't fall into that sin of pride. All sin, all sin is directly connected to pride, no matter what way you cut it. Pride is me saying that I know better than somebody else. I'm the best. I'm number one. Me, 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 I. That's pride. And we'll see in chapter two, the sin that's addressed is covetousness and pride. Chapter 2, verse 1. Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. At morning light they practice it, because it is in the power of their hand. Doing evil is one thing, right? You don't want to do evil. And they weren't just doing evil things in Israel. You know what they were doing? They are plotting and planning to do evil. It was premeditated. As they were laying in their bed at night, how can I rip this guy off tomorrow and take advantage of him? And God says, whoa, wait, you you guys can't be like that. This is the sin that we're going to address. At morning light, they practice, you know, evil for the most part is generally done at night. Many times in the Bible, it talks about the darkness, the sins that are practiced in the darkness. And they were so bold in this sin that they were even waiting for the sun to come up when the courts would open and take the cases of the people. They were so bold in their sin that they were going out to devise wicked and to do things to other people at the the beginning of the day. That's how they were starting their day. And I don't know about you guys, but I'll be transparent with you. Sometimes I have difficulty falling asleep at night. Because I lay down in my bed and my brain starts going, humming like a buzzsaw. All the things I have to do tomorrow, all the things that transpired today, all the things that need to get in line for next week. And I'm just like, stop, brain, stop, stop. And then an offense will come into my mind. Hey, what did that, what did, wait a minute, what did he say to me today? Did he actually say that? And if I meditate, if I stop on that thought, it, it turns very quickly into a tornado of, of negativity toward that person. And I think about what I'm going to say to them the next time I see them. Or if I'm going to say anything, or even if I'm going to talk to them at all. And then the Lord has brought Scripture to my mind in those moments to remind me, what are you doing Oh, your tongue is so sharp, Tim. You've got the right things to say. You know what you're going to do. But do you know what I would do in this situation? I would forgive without having even to be asked. 77 times 7. Oh, Lord, why do you talk to me? When I don't want you to talk to me, you talk to me. And then when I want you to talk to me, you don't talk to me. 
It's correction and rebuke and reproof, and it's good because I need it. I need God to instruct me. I need him to remind me. When it comes to interpersonal relationships, he loves people and he wants me to love people too. These people in Israel at this time, they were not loving each other. They were abusing each other. They were taking advantage of each other. They were going to bed thinking about how they could benefit from somebody else the next morning. Because it is in the power of their hand. Why were they doing evil? Because they had the, the, the capacity to do it, so they did it. One of the things we're going to look at deeper in this study is that a lot of the problems weren't just with the people in general. It was with the political leaders doing wrong. It was within their power to take advantage of the people, and they did it. They covet fields and take them by violence. Also houses and seize them. So they oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. What was the inheritance? The inheritance is what they received from the Lord. Nobody else had any business looking at it or trying to take it or ripping somebody else off. It was their inheritance. And it was at this time, if we want a reference in Scripture, it was at this time that Naboth's vineyard was a, a, a choice piece of land, and Ahab wanted it, and he goes back to his wife, and he's crying, oh, I like this vineyard so much, I want it for myself. And Jezebel says, if you want it, I'll take care of it for you. The wicked witch of the West riding her broom over. They kill Naboth. Why? Why? Because they wanted his inheritance. That vineyard was Naboth's right. It was his inheritance, not from anybody else, but from the Lord. We look at the Old Testament and we talk about, in particular, the nation of Israel. We have to remember that the promises of God and appointing Israelites to be God's people the promises of God really had to do a lot, a great deal with the land that they were uh, possessing. And if it wasn't an enemy that was coming in to take the land, it was them trying to take it from each other. And God is like, I can't let this go, you guys. I can't just let you treat each other like this. You're supposed to be different. You're supposed to be the light of the world. Even the Israelites back then, they were the example. And, and you're treating each other worse than the way the world does. What about your inheritance? What's your inheritance from the Lord? I, I think very strongly that some of the things that I've been given by the Holy Spirit, my inheritance directly are linked to the fruits of the Spirit. How many of you guys want the fruits of the Spirit to be manifested in your life every day? I do. Joy. I like to be happy and joyful. Can you tell? Peace, patience, kindness. That's our inheritance. And the enemy comes in to steal, kill, and destroy, right? He wants to take those things that have been given to us freely as our inheritance in Jesus Christ. He's directly blessed us with those things. The enemy wants to take them away. You know, I've met Christians who get upset with other Christians because of what God has given them. Listen, don't worry about it. What have you been given? What has God given you an inheritance of? How can you not only be content, but take those talents, take those things that God intended for you, and use them to bless others and to bless the Lord? Therefore, thus says the Lord, verse 3, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks, nor shall you walk haughtily, for this is an evil time. 
In that day, one shall take up a proverb against you and lament with a bitter lamentation, saying, We are utterly destroyed. He has changed the heritage of my people. How he has removed it from me to a turncoat, he has divided our fields." Therefore, you will have no one to determine boundaries by lot in the assembly of the Lord. What is the proclamation that God gives against them? It's not just against individuals, is it? It's against the families. Because the, the wickedness and the, and the sin had gotten so bad that it wasn't just affecting people on an individual basis anymore. It was families conspiring to take from others and to do wrong. You know what that reminds me of? The mafia. You know, like the Don, the dad's the big guy or grandpa or whoever, and the whole family is involved in the business and everybody profits from it. It's the whole families that were involved. And God says, I'm going to pronounce this against the family. You guys are all going to have to pay for these consequences. And in that day, one shall take up a proverb against you and lament with a bitter lamentation, saying, we are utterly destroyed. He has changed the heritage of my people. You know, you don't really uh, appreciate and, and take advantage of what you have until it's gone, right? And they're saying, they're saying, we were trying to take other people's inheritance. But as soon as the Lord says, hey, listen, you know, I'm going to take your heritage away. Oh, no, what do we have? We don't have anything. We, oh, the Lord has changed our, our heritage, our inheritance. I feel like God the Father, because he's God the Father, right? He's dealing with a bunch of snotty little kids, <laughs> Like, why are you taking his toy? I gave it to him. I gave you a toy. Now I'm going to take your toy away and put you in timeout for a little bit. He's like, guys, the Assyrians are coming. I'm going to put you in timeout and put you in captivity until you understand and realize that you cannot be treating each other this way. How he has removed it from me to a turncoat, he's divided our fields. And that again is talking about the Assyrians who will come in and and take the people into captivity. Therefore, you will have no one to determine boundaries by lot in the assembly of the Lord. The assembly of the Lord speaks of that fellowship, not only that the people had with God, but that they also had with each other and any kind of business dealings that they would do for land or whatever, you know, transactions wasn't going to happen anymore. You guys want to buy, sell, trade, whatever. It's not going to happen. You're going to go into captivity because of the sin that you've allowed to permeate an individual, a family, a national level. I'm really not one, and I'm not going to go into it this morning. I'm really not one for conspiracy theories or anything. But I'll tell you what, the closer that we get to the election, the more more, uh, saddened and disappointed I am. People are just so full of hate. And it, it just makes me think, you know, like we have this whole thing going on right now with Hillary and the email scandal and the confidentiality. And right now, like if you're high enough up and you have enough financial backing through these mega corporations, it almost seems like you can get away with anything. Amen. It's not just the laws that America have passed that God would, you know, address like abortion and all of those other things. It's, it's the actual way that, that people are treating each other. You know, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is prophesying about the end times, and he says that nation will rise against nation and people against people. That word for nation in the, in the Greek is actually races. Isn't that interesting? Race will rise against race is how you could read it in the Greek. And it's like, it's like you look around and that's what's happening. It's not just country against country. It's America, a melting pot of all these different cultures and races, and everybody is, is opposed to each other right now. And everybody's offended with each other right now. 
And what we need is we need to fall on our face like we talked a couple weeks ago and ask God to help us. We as the church, do you know what we need to do? We need to do two things mainly. The first thing is we need to pray. Because if you don't think prayer changes things, I'm going to tell you right now, you are wrong. I was just talking to a sister this morning whose daughter has been running from the Lord her entire life and she finally surrendered her life to the Lord and she's telling me all this good news and all these amazing things that are happening and she's so excited to see her so on fire and I said, think of all the years of prayer that you spent for your daughter and God is answering and you're seeing it with your own eyes right now. We need to pray. We have to pray. And the second thing we need to do, we need to love. It also says in those verses in Matthew chapter 24 that the love of many will wax cold. We're not talking about acceptance. We're not talking about tolerance. We're talking about loving without hypocrisy and sharing the gospel with love. That doesn't change the gospel we don't alter our message to not offend anybody. The, the, the gospel is offensive, but it needs to be conveyed and given in love. And I'll tell you what, it changes people's lives. We don't have facts to give. We have the truth to give. And it's administered in grace. When we administer the gospel in grace and in truth and in love, people are able to see the right character of God and and hopefully they see people who are rightfully representing God. Verse 6, Do not prattle, you say, to those who prophesy, so they shall not prophesy to you. They shall not return insult for insult. You who are named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord restricted? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? God is faithful to warn. He's warning them. He's sending them multiple prophets. Remember uh, that Micah was contemporary with Hosea and Isaiah. He's warning them and the people's response to the warning is shut up. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear what God wants from us or what God wants for us. You're a prattler, and we're tired of your prattling. They shall not return insult for insult. God says, then they won't, they'll stop prophesying. They'll stop telling you. You'll stop being warned, and, and ultimately, the day will come when the consequences are manifested. Is the Spirit of the Lord restricted? Do you know who you're dealing with? God Almighty? The God who brought them with a strong arm out of Egypt? That cared for them and loved them? Lately my people have risen up as an enemy. You pull off the robe with the garment from those who trust you as they pass by. Like men return from war. There's a procession you lead after wartime, especially in victory, and you, you can lead the prisoners. And the, the, the inner garment or the undergarments are the ones that you could just wear around. But the garment that it's talking about here is that, that uh, ornamental garment, the outer garment that's, that's decorated. And, and, and the Lord's saying, you, you guys have garments for yourself. You, you're, you're dressed but, but you reach out to those who trust you and you strip off their decorative garment. You strip off that which is on the outside for them to put it on yourself. Those who trust you. The women of my people you cast out from their pleasant houses. From their children you have taken away my glory forever. Also, in the context of war, if a soldier went out to war and he was returning home or he wasn't returning home, and the widow uh, of the the soldier who died in battle had an inheritance, she had a home and it was for her and her children, but she had no man to step up and protect that inheritance, they would come and they would kick her out with her kids and take her home. This was actually happening. Can you imagine a grieving widow who lost her husband for, uh, during a defense of the country and those in higher power would come in and take away what was rightfully hers? You've taken away my glory forever. 
the way that God manifests himself in those kind of situations, because God meets us in our hurting. He meets us in our pain. And whatever degree God would be able to meet the widow and the orphans, the, the, the leaders that took it away. They took it away. Arise and depart, for this is not your rest. Because it is, because it is defiled, it shall destroy. Yes, with utter destruction, if a man should walk in a false spirit and speak a lie, saying, I will prophesy to you of wine and drink, even he would be the prattler of his people. It's the same thing as we read in Timothy in the end days. Men are going to be seeking those uh, who tickle their ears. We just want to hear what we want to hear. Hey, bring some prophets in that are going to prophesy that we're going to have a good vintage this year. And we're going to have big parties. There's going to be lots of wine. And it's going to be crazy cool. It's going to be like 1999. <laughs> Those are the kind of people they wanted. Those were the kind of messages they wanted. Not the warnings. You can only warn somebody so much too, right? Again, back to the kids. If you, you, know, you had kids or you're a kid, you get warned. What's the reason for a warning? It's hopefully so that you stop doing what you're doing. And if you don't, then there's consequences. And they say, we don't want to hear your prophets. Give us, we're going to have our own prophets that are going to, they're going to announce prosperity. And, and they're, they're going to be blind to the things that are happening in our country right now. They're not going to address them. We're just going to institute more programs. We're going to, you know, do more things and, and put the people in positions that, that we want to be there. Prophesy good things instead of addressing the things that need to be addressed. And God says, uh, the consequences are coming. You don't want me to tell you anymore? Fine, I won't tell you anymore. You want people who are uh, going to come and prattle or tell you things that are beneficial to you? Uh, they can tell you, but that's not what's going to happen. And then look at verses 12 and 13. I get so frustrated with Israel. <laughs> what is wrong with you people? God loves you. He, he wants to care for you and and allow you to be this amazing example in the earth, and you just keep messing up. And I read, man, they're doing this to the widows and orphans, and oh, they're so mean to each other. Man, if I were God, I'd be taking care of business. Then verse 12, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise because of so many people. The one who breaks open will come, upon, come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. These verses are the verses of God's heart for the restoration of his people. It's like when we discipline. Listen, I love you, son. And I told you this is what was going to happen if you kept doing that thing. So this is the consequences. But it doesn't mean I don't love you. And it doesn't mean that I don't want to have a right relationship with you in the future. And God says, you guys are going to suffer your consequences. This is how you've been treating each other. This is why it's wrong. It's terrible. You're going to be taken into captivity. Assyrians are going to sweep in and, and wipe you out. But there's going to come a time when I'm going to restore you. And you're going to gather together. And there's going to be so many people gathered together. There's going to be a great noise, a roar of, of joy because the Lord has restored his people. And you're going to break out. The one who breaks open will come up before them. The one who breaks open, the other way to translate it is the breaker. This is a picture of Jesus Christ who breaks the bondage of sin whose desire is to lead his people, whose desire is to restore his people, and that's what he does. He leads us in triumph. Pass through the gate and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. And we want to be a people who are led by the Lord. Amen? We want to be a people who, as we cry out to the Lord for our neighbors and for our country and for our political leaders, 
that we can be those people who are examples and in the right place at the right time. Because God has strategically put each and every one of you exactly where you're at right now. And he says, I love you. I've given you a job. I've given you a career. I put you in these classes. I put you in this school. And I want you to be like me. I want you to be the people that are called by my name that are not only willing to talk about it, willing to live it, but demonstrate what your inheritance in Jesus Christ is. That's the challenge I have for you this morning as well. I want you to consider, even write it down, open up your journals or your notebooks and jot down on paper what are some of the things that you've inherited. We can go down a list from the Bible right now, but I think there's certain things that the Lord has impressed on your heart that he's given you. You want to know one thing that the Lord's impressed on my heart that he's given me and not anybody else that's super special? My wife. Oh boy, if there's anybody that, that uh, exemplifies grace, it's my wife. And I know that God had her special for me because I'm a goofball and I need a little special measure of grace. Stop nodding your head. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just had too many affirming nods after I said that. No, grace is, is my inheritance. She's my blessing that God's given me. There's things that God has given you on the spiritual level, on the physical level, on the relational level. I want you to think about those things this week and also consider that the enemy wants to take those things away from you. He wants to make them seem like they're not important, but they are. You may have the tendency to look around and, and at your brothers and sisters when you're thinking about these things and think, well, he has that gift and I want that gift, or she has that and I want that. Don't do it. Be content. Identify what you have been given by the, the grace of God and, and possess it and bless others. Do you know if we do that, what kind of church we're going to be? One that changes our world, changes this neighborhood. Not inward focused or inward reaching, but outward focused, outward reaching, and outward loving. And that just doesn't come naturally. That has to be uh, an empowering of the Holy Spirit. I am going to end a little early today because I'm really hot. I don't know if you guys are hot, but it is, it is baking in here. So let's uh, consider those things. We wrapped up chapter 2. We're going to do chapter 3 next week. And uh, let's pray. God, we pray that... that um, that we would be wise. Even as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves, that when you correct us, when you want to bring something up, when you give us a warning, we take it to heart. That we take it seriously. We say, our way is not the best way. And, and we don't really need this thing that we've been holding on to with all of our might. God, and we want correction. If there's some covetousness or pride in our lives, it's, it's easy to look at the nation of Israel and point the finger. But Lord, we want you to show us too what needs to be addressed. God, we want to ask that you would allow us to live in the full capacity of the inheritance that you've given us. We love your word, God. We love you. We thank you for all the things that you've been doing in our church lately. Some of them are physical, and we don't want to dwell on those things, but just the helpers that have been coming and working on the church and the paint that was donated and the, and the tent that's getting donated and all this. Lord, you've provided for us to have a home, to be a family. And Lord, we want to respond well. We thank you, God, for being a giving God and that our response to you would be to give back. 
would be to give as well, because it is more blessed to give than to receive. We love you, Lord. We ask that you would empower us to be your witnesses this week. In Jesus' precious name, amen.